Well, good morning. It's good to see you here today. Good to have everybody that's out there online with us today as well. We're going to be in the book of Proverbs, uh, pretty much right in the middle of your Bible. If you're looking for it, you'll find the book of Proverbs chapter 7 is what we're going to dive into today. And as you're turning there, let me just let you know, we're going to be spending some time in the book of Proverbs coming up. I would encourage you to read through it. Uh, there's lots of different ways you can read through the book of Proverbs. Uh, it's pretty short chapters, really easy to digest. It's good practical stuff. That's what I love about the book of Proverbs. And uh, I think that's what you're going to love about this sermon series we're entering into. It's going to be incredibly practical and pointed and useful for your life uh, if you will apply it to your life. But I want to encourage you to be reading through the book of Proverbs. One of the most common ways people read through the book of Proverbs is just to find whatever day of the month it is and then read that chapter. So if it's the first day of the month, you'd read chapter one. If it's the second, chapter two and on through. Uh, there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. A lot of our months have 31. For those that have 28 or 30, you can adjust a little bit there at the end to make up for that. But uh, I would encourage you just to do that uh, over the next couple of months as we're working through this. Just read through the book of Proverbs. And as you're doing that, uh, I would also encourage you to circle, underline, highlight, whatever your method is, the word path or paths. Every time you come across that in the book of Proverbs, because that is the title of our series, The Path. If I had to sum the book of Proverbs up, uh, that's the word I would use to sum it up. God is giving us, through the wisdom of Solomon, uh, a path or a series of paths that work in life, and he's showing us the paths that don't. And uh, paths are incredibly important, as we're going to discover in this series. I also, at the beginning of this series, just want to uh, mention a book I read that was incredibly instrumental uh, in my research and uh, putting the series together. Uh, it's written by a guy by the name of Andy Stanley. You may have heard of his dad, Charles Stanley. You may have heard of Andy as well. He's a pretty well-known guy, uh, too. He wrote a book in 2009 that uh, I wasn't familiar with until I started doing the research for this sermon uh, called The Principle of the Path. And a lot of what he said in that book comes out of the book of Proverbs and uh, has been very instrumental in my thoughts as I've been putting this together. In fact, our big idea for today is kind of his big idea uh, for the entire book. And so I'm going to try to do my best to, to quote Andy if I read something directly out of the book, but uh, I am going to be weaving a lot of his thoughts and ideas uh, in throughout this sermon series because uh, his book was, was one of the, the main resources I used or, or influenced me uh, in the creation of the series. So I wanted to say that up front as well. So paths are important. And there's lots of different paths. We need to, to recognize that early on in this series. Uh, let's talk about some of the big paths we have in our life. So uh, we could talk about spiritual paths. Uh, that would be important, right, for us as believers and uh, here at church. There's also financial paths, the different kinds of paths we can take uh, with the money and the wealth that God provides us and the stewardship that we're called to in that. There are what we might call relational paths, and that, that's a big group, right? That can be your marriage, it can be your relationship with your kids or your boss, your employer, your neighbor next door, uh, a lot of relational paths in life. There are professional paths. How many of you have a job? Amen. Uh, wow, y'all all retired? What's going on? How many of y'all have a job? Am I the, oh, okay. I thought I was starting to think I was the only one who had a job. <laughs> Woo, okay, good. Y'all just weren't listening yet. You're tuning you in here. So there's professional paths, and uh, the Bible speaks a lot to, to our professional paths. There's, there's also what I might call uh, recreational paths, what we do with our free time the paths we take uh, recreationally in life. So there's lots of different paths, and praise God, His Word gives us direction for every single one of them. So we're going to be talking about that in this series. Let me ask you this question by show of hands. How many of you have ever been lost? Only the women. <laughs> That's what I thought was going to happen. Uh, the men, like, nope, never been lost. Not once, not my entire life. I know men that are in their 80s, and they've never been lost. 
magically, mysteriously, some way, they, they have never once uh, been lost. Have you ever been so lost, though, that you didn't even know what direction to go? Like, there's a difference between being kind of lost and being really lost. Like, when you're kind of lost, you, you at least kind of know the direction you need to go. Like, hey, if I go that direction, I think I'll run into that highway. Or if I go back that direction, I think I'll come back to that road where I took the wrong turn. Like, that's when you're just kind of lost, but you at least have a little bit of direction as to which way to go. And then there's being so lost and so turned around, you have absolutely no idea where to go. There's a difference between the two, isn't there? Um, you know, I was thinking about road trips the other day, and our kids are a little bit older now. This isn't, isn't as big of a deal. They still do it, but not near as much as they did when they were younger. But when, when my kids were younger and we would leave off on a big road trip, say we were going to Kansas or we were going to Florida, like we were going somewhere far, inevitably, we'd get about 15 to 20 miles out of town before the first one would ask. You know what they would ask? <laughs> Are we there yet? Or, or maybe, how, how much further, Dad? A long way. We, we've just gotten started. Or how much longer is it going to be, Dad? It's the same question, just phrased in different ways. And they're going to ask you that question 400 times, right? And no matter what. But there's another question your kids will ask you, at least my kids uh, would, would ask me uh, a lot of times. They, they, they would always wait until we were well into the trip before this question came up. And it was always when we were far enough away from, from where we live that the roads are a little bit unfamiliar and the towns are unfamiliar. And, and then they would ask this question. They would say, where are we? Where are we, Dad? And my answer became over time, I was always looking for a good answer for that. I would just say, we're on planet Earth. That's where we are. And they would say, Dad, Dad. We know we're on planet Earth, but where are we? And I would say, well, we're, we're in the United States of America. Dad, I know, but where are we? Well, we're in Mississippi or Alabama or Texas, wherever we happen to be. No, Dad, where, where are we? Now, when they would ask that question, there were, there were two things that were guiding my answer. Number one, I really don't like lying to my kids. Lying to your kids isn't a good thing. Abby and I... Uh, very early on in our parenting, we, we decided we were going to do our best not to lie to our children. So we, we didn't lie to our kids about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or any of that stuff. We, we were like, we're not going to lie to them. And so I don't want to lie to them. But number two, and th this is, has to be part of the equation as well, I don't want to admit that I don't know <laughs> where we're at. Because when you get out there, mom and dad, you know how this is. You get out there, you get on the highway, you hit the cruise control, and once... Once you're pointed the right direction, like if you're going east to Florida, as long as you're on I-10, headed east, and the GPS lady's not yelling at you, and the lady that's your passenger's not yelling at you, <laughs> there's a pretty good chance you're going the right way. And so you just kind of get in that zone where you're just driving. You don't know where you're at. You don't know what town you're in or what town you just passed. Now, it wasn't always this way. Y'all remember the old days when you had to get the atlas out, the road atlas, or the maps? Before you went on a big trip, you'd get a map for each state. And then I remember, like, when I was a kid growing up, my mom would unfold that map, which was huge. It's like, bigger than the car. And my dad would be slapping the map because he can't see in the mirror, can't see what's going on. And my mom's trying to read the map, but it's upside down. And we're all in a big pickle because of this huge map. Well, today we don't have to do that anymore because we have a GPS. And, and as long as you're pointed the right direction and the lady on the GPS isn't yelling at you, you're probably on the path you need to be on to get to wherever your destination is. If I want to go to Canada, I need to point my vehicle which direction? North, right. If I want to go to California, it better be pointed west. I mean, there's a way to get there if you go east, but probably not if you're driving. And it's a long way to go all the way around, you know? So you want to make sure you're going the right direction. Why? Here's our big idea. 
Because your direction determines your destination. More than anything else in life, your direction is what determines your destination. Can I tell you a few things that don't determine your destination? And, and these are things that a lot of people commonly think do determine their destination, but they don't. These are things that do not determine your destination. I would encourage you to jot them down and think about them. We're not going to spend a lot of time on them, but think about them later. Number one, your intentions do not determine your destination. A lot of people have the best intentions in the world, but your intentions ultimately don't determine where you end up. You can have the best intentions of all for whatever you're talking about, whatever path you're talking about. But if your intentions don't translate into action, they will have no determination on where you end up or where your destination is. Here's another one I hear a lot, circumstances. But pastor, you don't know my circumstances. It's different for me. You, you don't know the family I was born into. You don't know the financial situation I married into. You, you don't know this. You don't know that. It's always circumstantial. And you're right, I don't. And circumstances can play a big, big role in our lives as we're going down paths. But at the end of the day, your circumstance doesn't dictate or determine where you end up. It doesn't determine where your destination is. Your circumstance is not the determinative factor in whether or not you're going to get to your destination or not. Your direction is. Here's another one, dreams. We might call it hopes or dreams. Lots of people I know in life have had the big hopes and big dreams and big ideas. And they never got to their destination. Not because their dreams weren't there. Not because their goals and their hopes weren't, weren't good goals or hopes. It's because they got on a path that was going the wrong direction to get them to their goal. Here's, here's two more for you. Strengths and weaknesses. We all have them. We all have strengths and weaknesses. But those things don't determine whether or not you get to your destination. Family doesn't determine it. I know there are a lot of people in life who say, well, if I would have been born into that family, if I would have gotten that trust fund, if, if, if I would have lived in that neighborhood growing up, if he would have been my dad, if she would have been my mom, then it would be different for me. No, it wouldn't have. Because your family doesn't determine your destination. Your path does. Your direction does. And here's the last one I'll give you. And these aren't, this isn't an exhaustive list. These are just the main ones I, I've heard over 20 years in ministry. Determination. Determination is important. You've got to have determination to get anywhere in life. But no matter how much determination you have, it's not going to alter your destination. It's not the, the determining factor on where you end up. Your direction is. These are all things that we face in life as we're walking down life's paths, but at the end of the day, they don't determine our de destination. What determines your destination is your direction. Here's the thing about paths, and, and you'll know this um, to be true. Every path leads somewhere. Every road you drive down leads somewhere. Every path you walk down in the forest leads somewhere. It leads to a destination. And here's what you have to understand about paths as we're getting into Proverbs and getting into the paths that God has for us in the Bible. Who you are, what you are, your circumstances, your determination, your intentions, your dreams, your hopes, your goals, whatever it is, doesn't determine what's at the end of the path. If you get on the wrong path, it's going to lead you to the wrong destination. That's what the Bible says. And if you get on the right path, it's going to lead you to the right destination. What's at the end of the path is at the end of the path for everybody who walks on that path. Because a path leads you to a destination. It doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are. It doesn't matter if you're white or if you're black. It doesn't matter if you're young or if you're old. It doesn't matter if you're, you're smart or average or less than average educationally. Whatever path you get on Whatever direction you head in life, that is going to be what ultimately determines where you end up. Your direction determines your destination. I want to read to you today from Proverbs 7, and I want to start at the end. I want, to see you, I want you to see where this story ends, and then we're going to back up and pick it up from the beginning 
and began to walk through it together today. Look with me at verse 24. It says, Now, sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words from my mouth. Don't let your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't stray onto her paths. There's our word, paths. For she has brought many down to death. Her victims are countless. Her house is the road to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. Watch out what path you're on because your path determines your destination. Your direction determines your destination. Most of Proverbs chapter 7 is devoted to the story of a young man who chooses the wrong path. And that path ultimately leads him to a destination he did not want to go. Now you know the end of the story. Let's back up and start from the beginning and see what we can learn from the direction or the paths this young man chose. The first thing we learn is about the direction of arrogance. As we follow his story here through chapter 7, what what I want to do is I want to point out the different directions or the different paths that he chose to walk down that led him to his ultimate destination. And you're going to be surprised how many of these line up with people you know or perhaps even with yourself. And the first one is the direction of arrogance. You don't want to go this direction in life. You don't want to get on this path in life. How many of you know somebody who's a know-it-all? Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, it's probably you. I saw a bumper sticker a while back. It's been years ago. I, I, I didn't write it down, but I remember it. I may not be quoting it exactly, but it said something to this effect. It said, people who think they know everything are extremely annoying to those of us who actually do. <laughs> we all have a touch of pride and arrogance inside of us. We can all be arrogant about one thing or another. Um, as we're talking about the direction of arrogance, what we're really talking about is people who think that the rules don't apply to them, that the principles of life don't apply to their life or their situation or their circumstances, that the ways of life are different for them than it is for everybody else, that they somehow can walk down a path that others have walked down and end up at a different destination than everybody else who's walked down that path. That's the definition of somebody who's arrogant. They are the exception to the rule. They're going to be the ones that it turns out different for. They're not going to end up at that destination, even though they're walking down the path that leads to that destination. Now, to be sure, there are some people who are more arrogant than others. There are people out there who are truly know-it-alls about everything, but I don't think that describes most of us. Most of us are, are what I call situationally arrogant people. In other words, we're arrogant in certain circumstances and situations or around certain topics. We're cocky and conceited and overly confident in, in certain circles or about certain things. Maybe you're particularly bold in matters that relate to your profession because you've been doing it a long time and you're really good at it and you have a lot of experience in it. And so you think you know more than everybody else who does what you do or works where you work. You can become arrogant and get on a path to arrogance with that, no matter what your profession is. Or maybe it's your hobby. Maybe you're a, a truck guy, or, or maybe you're, you, you've got some other hobby, and you've been following it and reading the magazines and doing it forever. And, and whenever it comes to that, whatever that thing happens to be, maybe it's fishing or hunting or whatever it is, you, you're, you've got a touch of arrogance. You know better than everybody else. Maybe it's your community because after all, you've lived here for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. You, you were here whenever it was, you know, dirt roads and, and, and the wagon trains were coming through, right? And so you, you know this community and you know everything about this community. And so when it comes to this community, you, you, you're arrogant. You, you have a situational arrogance about you in that one area. It can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. But honestly, here's the thing with arrogance, even a little bit of it is bad, right? You've heard the saying, just a little bit goes a long way. Isn't that true of arrogance? Just a little bit of arrogance goes a really, really long way, doesn't it? 
And just a little bit of arrogance can get you on the wrong path that ultimately will put you in a position where you end up at a destination you don't want to be. Look at Proverbs chapter 7. Let's back up to verse 6 and start with this young man's story. It says, At the window of my house, this is Solomon writing, At the window of my house I looked through my lattice, and I saw among the inexperienced, I noticed among the youths, a young man lacking sense. Now, we don't know if this was a real event that Solomon actually saw through his window with his own eyes, or if it was just an event maybe he heard about and decided for poetic reasons to write it as if he saw it himself. Or maybe it's more of a parable, a lesson that he wanted to get out to the world so everybody could learn from this lesson. You know, Jesus was a big teller of parables. They're, they're a big teaching things. So maybe Solomon was doing that. We don't really know. But it doesn't change the moral of the story. It doesn't change the things we can learn about being on the right path. We can't be sure, but we do know that this person started down the wrong path because he was young and he lacked sense. Now, on one hand, this is no surprise, is it? Because young people are not generally the smartest people. They're not. Young people are not wise people. Now, I'm not picking on you if you're young. We have a lot of young people in our church. We have a lot of young people in the room. I'm not picking on you if you're young and dumb. <laughs> but the problem is, you don't know you're dumb. <laughs> That's the problem. And, and I say I'm not picking on you because I was young and dumb. And whether your mom or dad will tell you or not, they were too. It's just part of being young. Part of being young is you don't know near as much as you think you know. Part of being young is you don't have the wisdom that you think you have. You're not as smart as you think you are. And, and what happens is when you're young, you become extremely arrogant because you think you're smarter than everybody else. You think you're smarter than your mom. You think you're smarter than your dad. You think you're smarter than your grandma and your grandpa. You think you're smarter than your preacher. You're smarter than God. You're smarter than the Bible. This is old school stuff, right? And it's going to be different for you. That's arrogance. We, we don't know exactly how old this young man was, but the context of his story that we're about to get into uh, would lead you to believe he's probably in his late teens, early 20s, maybe mid-20s, and that's when we have no sense at all, amen? I mean, that is like when we are at our dumbest point in life. And the problem is, this is a point in life where we make some of the most critical decisions that affect the destinations we end up at later on in life. And so it's important, if you're in this range in life, if you're one of the young people in the room, it's important that you listen to this point. Because the path you choose now will determine the destination you arrive at in your 30s and 40s and 50s. And so you've got to be careful that you don't let your arrogance get you on the wrong path. This is an age range in which we tend to be particularly arrogant. This guy, he thought he had it all figured out. He knew better than everybody else. He's living the life he had always dreamed of. His fantasies are coming true, and he's ready to have some fun. And it's his arrogance and his inexperience that led him down to start down the wrong path in life. Do you remember what Solomon said near the end of the chapter? He said, don't, mm -mm, don't stray into her paths. She's going to lead you to a bad place, and ultimately, you're going to descend to the chambers of death. Arrogance, pride, selfishness, overconfidence, being conceited, whatever you want to call it, these things are quick ways to find yourself on the wrong path in life. If you don't believe me, adults, think of it this way. Approach your marriage with arrogance, and don't be surprised when you end up in divorce. I had one guy come up to me after the first service, and he said, man, I wish I would have heard that sermon before I met my first wife. Approach your marriage with arrogance and see where it ends up. It's going to take you to a destination you don't want to end up in. It's a path. And once you get on it, if you don't get off of it, it goes to the same place. Approach your finances with arrogance. And don't be surprised when you end up broke. That's what the destination is. Approach your career or your boss 
or your supervisor with arrogance, and don't surprise when you end up unemployed. Because that's the destination. Approach your relationship with God with arrogance, and don't be surprised when you end up on your knees humbled, because that's the destination. Your direction, more than anything else, determines your destination. And if you choose this direction, you're not going to end up where you want to be. The Word of God has much to say about this destination, about this issue of arrogance. Proverbs actually has a lot to say about it. Since we're here, we'll stay here. Proverbs 16.5, everyone with a proud heart is detestable to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. Jump down to verse 18 of Proverbs 16, and it says this, Pride comes before destruction, and an arrogant spirit before a fall. Is that the path you want to be on? Is that the destination you want to end up at? It's something we all know to be true. It's something we've seen in the life of somebody else, but it's hard to see it when it's happening to us. We know that the direction of arrogance never leads to a good destination, But so many times we have trouble spotting it in our own lives. And so if we don't listen to the wisdom of the people around us who are saying, hey, you're getting on the wrong path here, we're prone to get on this path and stay on it until it reaches its destination, which is never good. This is why we have to really pay attention and we have to make sure we're not entering this wrong path from the beginning. There's a very clear warning about the dangers of arrogance in Proverbs 26.12 Do you see a person who is wise in his own eyes, a know-it-all, somebody who's arrogant, somebody the rules don't apply to, the principles of God don't apply to, because they're different? Well, there's more hope for a fool, he says, than for him. Yikes. (laughs) That's rough. (laughs) But it's right. It's true. When we allow our arrogance to cause us to become wise in our own eyes, we're in trouble. And we're on a path that doesn't lead to anything good. And you're about to see that's exactly what happens to the guy in our passage. He thought he knew it all, but in reality, the older, much wiser Solomon could see that the path he was starting down was a bad one. So before we move on, let me just tell you how to avoid this, how to avoid the wrong paths in your life. I want to do that with every point in this message. We can sum it up with this. It's the next blank on your outline. You have to know that you don't know. Approach everything in life humbly and with an open mind and an open heart. Be teachable. At every stage and age of your life, have a teachable spirit, a teachable heart, and and, and just a teachableness about you. Even if you're the expert in the matter and you've been doing it for 30 years, be open to learn something new every day. Listen to counsel. Consider the options. Even if you've been been married for 50 years, don't get arrogant in that and think it's a sure thing. Be teachable every single day, especially if you're a man. Be teachable. She's not done with you yet. Pray to God. Ask God to guide you and direct you. Be teachable every time you come to the Word, even if you've been reading it for 80 or 90 years. Say, God, I want to learn something new from you today. Be willing to admit that you don't know everything and you need help and direction no matter what area of life you're in. Because if you don't, the direction of arrogance will sneak up on you and it'll put you on a path you don't want to be on. And your direction determines your destination. Here's the next thing we see. I call it the direction of darkness. The direction of darkness. If the path you are walking on requires you to do it in the darkness or the shadows, it's probably not the right path. You're probably going the wrong direction and you're on the wrong path. And that path is eventually going to put you at a destination you don't want to be be at if you're on a path that you're only willing to walk in the darkness. Go back to the story with me and look at verse 7. I saw among the inexperienced and I noticed among the youths a young man lacking sense crossing the street near her corner. He strolled down the road to her house at twilight in the evening in the dark of night. Are you starting to get a bad feeling about this situation? You should be. 
Because this young man does not seem to understand or realize that he's not on a good path. And he's chosen to go out at night for a reason. But it seems even more obvious because whatever he's about to do, he felt he had to do it under the cover of darkness. I have a general rule in my life, and I think it's a good general rule that everybody should apply to their life. It's this, if you can't do it in the daylight, you don't need to do it at all. If you can't do it in the daylight, you don't need to do it at all. And I don't just mean like you can only do stuff when the sun's up. I'm using light here kind of figuratively. What, what I mean by that is if I'm not willing to tell my wife about it, I don't need to do it. Right? If I would be embarrassed if my kids saw me doing it, or if I had to tell my kids what I did, then I don't need to be doing it. If, if I would be ashamed if my mom found out I was doing it, or if I thought my dad was going to come over and beat me up if he found out I was doing it, I don't need to do it. If you have to hide whatever you're doing from your friends or your family or people who love you, if you have to hide whatever you're doing from people who God has put in your life to hold you accountable, then that's a clear sign you're on the wrong path. You're going the direction of darkness, and that always leads to a very dark destination. What did Jesus say in John chapter 8? Jesus spoke to them again, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Church, we're not people of the night. We're people of the light in Christ. The light of Christ lives inside of you and inside of me. Therefore, we should not be dwelling and dealing in the shadows and the darkness. I really like what Jesus says in John chapter 11, verse 9. Aren't there 12 hours in a day? Jesus answered, if anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. If, the, if you're only willing to walk the path at night, if you're only willing to dwell on that path at night in the darkness, then you're sure to be on the wrong path, and you're sure to be on a path that's going to make you stumble and fall. It's a dangerous path, and it's going to lead you to a very dark destination. If the path that you are on is shady, get off of it. Always keep that in mind. Whenever you're examining the paths of your life, is this a path I only want to be on in the darkness? If so, it's not the right path. Let me tell you why. It's because of this. The dark path is a dangerous path. And if, if you enter a dark path, you're automatically on a dangerous path that's leading you to a dark and dangerous destination. And your direction, more than anything else in life, determines your destination and where you're going to end up. And you don't want to end up where that dark path is going to take you. Finally, let's look at what I call the direction of ease. And we're going to pick this story up next week. And we're going to learn a lot more about the different directions this young man took and how it applies to our life. But we're going to close with this one today. The direction of ease. How, how many of you would give an amen in agreement to the following statement? The easy way is not generally the best way. You've learned that lesson? Have you ever thought something was going to be easy? It was going to be simple? Have you ever thought something was a sure thing? Are those not the things that always turn out to be the biggest wrecks in your life? You want to know why? Because the direction or the path of easy and ease is almost always the wrong path. And it will almost always lead you to the wrong destination. If you don't believe me, think about it. What would happen? What, what would happen, just practically speaking, what would happen if you only did the easy things in your marriage? If you never did anything that was hard in your marriage? If you, if you said, you know what, I'm only going to do what's easy, what would happen? What would happen if you only did the easy things with money? If you only did the easy things with your finances, well, we don't have to imagine it. We can just look at our country and look at Congress, and you can see what happens. 
if you never make a hard decision or a hard choice? What would happen at your job if you just said, you know what, Uh, I'm going to go to work, but I'm only going to do the easy stuff. If it's hard, I'm just not going to do it. What about with your kids? How do you think your kids would turn out if you only did the easy things? If you never disciplined them, if you never sat down and talked with them and had hard conversations? What do you think your kids would, would end up like if you only did the easy thing? What about your spiritual walk? How, how would your relationship with God be if you only did the easy stuff? You know, like, oh, I'm just going to go to church Christmas and Easter. Sit back, kick back, watching my pajamas at home online. I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm not going to get in a small group. I'm not going to dive in, dig in. I'm not going to allow God to change me. I mean, I'm going to go and listen, but I'm not going to apply it to my life. No, oh, golly. That's hard. I'm not going to change anything. You think spiritually that's going to get you to the destination you really want to be at? What about your physical health? What if you only do the easy stuff? You never do the hard stuff. You see, if you take the direction of easy, it's not going to get you to the destination you want to end up at in any area of life. This is why the devil always puts easy in front of us. It's why he puts the wide, easy road right in front of us. Because he knows we love easy, and if we see an easy way, we're prone to take it. But what did Jesus say? Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter through the narrow gate. That doesn't sound easy. For the gate is wide and the road broad. Now that sounds easy. But where does that path lead? Well, it leads to destruction, according to Jesus. And there are many who go through that path, that easy path, that easy road. Verse 14, how narrow is the gate and difficult the road. Well, that doesn't sound easy. But where does that path lead? Well, it leads to life. But only a few find it because, well, it's not easy. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? The path you choose matters and it's going to determine your destination. Your direction determines your destination. And if you're stuck on easy, if you're saying the easy road's the only road I'm ever going to walk, you can be almost 100% certain that it's the wrong road. If the road or path you're on is easy, that should probably get your attention. And you should probably take notice and say, you know what, this may not be taking me to the place I want to go. Look at Proverbs 7 with me. Let's start in verse 8 where we left off. It says, Crossing the street near her corner, he strolled down the road to her house at twilight in the evening in the dark of night, the direction of darkness. A woman came to meet him dressed like a prostitute, having a hidden agenda. She's loud and defiant. Her feet do not stay at home. Now the street, now the squares... She lurks at every corner. She grabs him and kisses him. Young men, can I just tell you something? If she's that easy, she ain't right. If she's that easy, it's the wrong path. And it's going to take you to the wrong destination. Solomon, he could see it. He's older. He's wiser. Hopefully you can see it. Hindsight's always 20-20. It's easy to read about it. We look at this and we go, man, that looks way too easy. Well, it is. And the easy path is not the right path. But this young man, here's the problem. This young man can't see it because he's too excited. He's pumped up. This is his dream come true. This is his fantasy right in front of his face. And he's ready to embrace it and walk down that path. I want to encourage you, if your path is easy, be cautious and be careful. Because that easy path 
might not take you where you want to go. It's not going to take this guy where he wants to go. See, I, peop- I see people all the time doing easy and doing convenient things. I'm guilty. I've done easy things in my life. I'm not, I'm not immune to any of this stuff we're talking about. I'm not trying to tell you I'm perfect. I'm certainly not. But I can tell you I learned pretty early on in life that if I wanted to get to the destination I had in mind, the destination God had for me, I was going to have to do hard things. I was going to have to make sacrifices. We were going to have to struggle when we were young. We were going to have to do things God's way, which wasn't going to be easy. But I can tell you, after being in ministry as long as I have, I've seen a lot of people doing easy for a long time. And they're on the path of easy, and they can't figure out that this isn't going to be the right destination. I'll just give you a few examples. I'm not trying to beat anybody up. But I see people all the time doing easy with their money, with their finances. You know what's easy with money? Credit cards. Swipe it. It's plastic. Go on vacation on your credit card. Who cares if it's 15% interest? Buy your Christmas presents with your credit cards. Who who cares if it takes you till next November to pay last Christmas off? You know what's easy? Car payments. Divide it up. Get you a new car every three or four years. The problem is that path leads you to poverty. It leads you to being upside down on your car. It leads you to a place where you're 60 or 70 years old And you don't own anything in life because you've made payments on everything your whole life. You know what's easy? You get to 60 or 70 and somebody calls you on the phone and says, hey, we got a great deal for you. Let's do a reverse mortgage on your house. And it's easy and people sign up for them all day every day. But it's not a good path for you or those who are going to inherit whatever you have. But it's easy. And because you've done easy your whole life with money and you've ended up at a certain destination, you have no choice but to make another easy choice, or at least that's what you think. I've seen people, I'm telling you guys, I've seen three men, three men drain their entire retirement accounts for some 20-year-old bombshell who lives in Russia who sent them a message on Facebook. All three of them ended up sending over half a million dollars to her. Never saw her, never met her. Probably not even a real person. I told all three of them the same thing when they came in to talk to me about it. All three of them, in one way or another, I'm not a very good counselor. I've told you all that before. If you want good counsel, don't come to me. Because I just tell you just like it is. I looked at all three of them and I said, now what do you think a bomb like that? This beautiful Russian woman, what do you think she wants with a wrinkled 85-year-old like you? What do you have to offer her? Just your money. And when it's gone, so will she. And sure enough, when the money ran out, guess what? The messages stopped coming. Those sweet phone calls at 2 a.m. quit coming. Because he or she, (laughs) who knows, got whatever they wanted and they were gone. It was an easy path, but it was the wrong one. I see people all the time doing easy with their marriage. Can I just tell you, marriage isn't easy. If you want to do something easy, don't get married. But I see people all the time doing easy with their marriage. And you know what that results in? You know the destination? Divorce. I see people all the time doing easy with their business, getting shady with their business deals, doing things out on the fringe morally, letting their integrity go just so they can make that deal and get a little more money and buy that whatever next thing they want. They get on that path of easy, and it takes them to a destination they don't want to be. I see people doing easy with their friendships. I see people doing easy with their kids. It's like all we want is easy. We're just conditioned to easy, easy, easy. And can I just tell you, easy never takes you where you want to go. And people look at me and they say I'm old school and they say I'm old fashioned and they make fun of me for driving a 2005 Toyota with over 340,000 miles on it. But I hadn't had a car payment since 2008. It hadn't been easy, but it's been fine. I drive it all over the country. Still gets me there. Only had to pull over once and get towed. Wasn't that bad. 
And that's why I've become extremely suspicious and suspect of easy. When I see something that's easy, I automatically go, eh, I don't know if that's a path I want to go down. Because it seems like everybody who goes down the easy path ends up getting destroyed. And I'll tell you why. Because the easy path is often the evil path. It may not look like that when you take your first steps down it, but the further down it you get, the more you come to realize it's not the path you want to be on. The easy path is often the evil path. So be very, very careful and never forget that your direction, more than anything else, determines your destination. The path you choose is a path, and there's already a destination at the end of it. And that destination is not going to change because of who you are, what you are, where you are in life, no matter how much knowledge or money or wealth or good looks or charm or whatever else you think you've got, No, the destination is the destination. Examine the path. And if it's easy, be suspect. As we close, I want to tell you today that I hope you'll do something with this. I hope you'll come back next week because we're going to learn some more about this guy. And the story gets real juicy. I know y'all are probably going to go ahead and read it. Go ahead. It's good. But it gets real juicy. It's going to be kind of PG-13 next week, I'll just warn you. Um, If you got younger kids, you may want to put them in children's church. But it's going to be full of practical stuff just like this. But I want you to go home, and I want you to examine the path you're on, and I I want you to really do some thinking about this. Are you seeing warning signs on the path you're on? What are you going to do about it? Are you going to turn around, or are you just going to keep walking? Because, see, a lot of you are like what I described at the beginning of this message. You're like me on a long road trip. You're not really lost. Because you're still on a path, you're on a road, you just don't really know where you are. And that perhaps is the most dangerous place to be. Because when you're so lost, you don't know where you are, you go, now I need help. But as long as you're on a path and you see all your friends on a path that looks like your path, and you see everybody around you on a path that looks like your path, you're going, ah, this is probably going to get me to the destination I want to get to. The problem is you just haven't gotten to the end of the path to realize... It doesn't have a good ending. So examine your path in light of this man and the things we've talked about and turn around if you need to turn around. Start now. Do something with it. Some of you might not be walking with Jesus at all. Can I just tell you there's only one path to heaven? One path, and his name is Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. If you don't repent, confess, and believe in him, I don't care what you do, how good your intentions are, I don't care how how much you've dreamt about your mansion in heaven, you don't have one if your name is not in the Lamb's Book of Life. I don't care how good of a person you've been, I, I don't care what your mama did, or if your granddaddy was a preacher. You can memorize the whole Bible. If you don't know Jesus, it won't do you a lick of good when the time comes, because you're on the wrong path. Your direction and your path determine your destination. And if you want your destination to be heaven, you have to repent. You have to believe. You have to confess. You have to walk with the Lord. So if that's your testimony today, you're not doing those things, get on the path that leads to life. His name is Jesus. Let's pray. If you're here this morning and have never given your life to the Lord, we invite you to do so. Not by walking an aisle or standing or raising a hand, but simply by praying with us. Just say this, say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new. I repent of my sins and ask by faith that you would forgive me today. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your patience and for your love, and for giving me a path to you. Lord, we thank you for those who have just prayed with us and We look forward to see what you're going to do with their life, their new life in you. And Lord, we are especially grateful that you are the way maker, the path maker. 
Lord, when all hope was gone, when it all seemed lost, when we were still sinners, lost in our sins, when we were enemies of the cross, you sent your son Jesus to make a path to heaven, a path to righteousness, a path to holiness, a path to a relationship with you. You made a path through the cross. And Lord, we rejoice in that. Father, forgive us for taking the wrong paths in life. The easy paths. Lord, forgive us for taking the dark paths. Lord, for, forgive us for our arrogance that got us on the wrong path. Lord, help us to really examine where we're at. And if we don't know, Lord, help us to have the courage and the faith to ask for your help to get us go in the right direction because our direction determines our destination. I thank you for giving us the word of God, for giving us the book of Proverbs that is full of so much wisdom when it comes to our paths. And I look forward to our time in the weeks ahead as we examine these paths and these ways that we can walk with you and be blessed because of it. Because just like many of these paths in life lead to destruction, there are also paths that lead to blessing every time. And Lord, I look forward to unpacking those with your church in the weeks ahead. Bless us this week with what we have. Help us to examine our path. In Jesus' name we pray.